Here we are again with the Anomatron 6000, our state-of-the-art simulation computer that helps us create hyper-accurate simulations of some of the world's most bizarre scenarios. Whether it's SCP-096 versus Siren Head, Abel versus Chainsaw Man, or now perhaps our most ridiculous matchup yet, SCP-035, the Diabolical Possessive Mask, versus The Mask, the popular Jim Carrey character based on the hyper-violent comic book of the same name. So, what the heck are we waiting for? Let's crank up the machine and see what the results are. Somebody stop me! Okay, so what have we got on intake today? Researcher Werb asked, a tone of boredom hanging off his every word. A uh, possible anomalous entity? His compatriot Dr. Mackney replied, sipping his coffee, sounding equally as unenthused. Caucasian male, early 30s, a team of our agents picked him up in... The Foundation doctor checked his notes. Some place called Edge City? Real appealing tourist spot, he added sarcastically. <laughs> now what's so anomalous about him? Werb questioned, his eyes lazily scanned over a file Mackney had handed him. Says here he's just an ordinary bank teller. There's one prior arrest on his record, but the charges were dropped later on. Man, this guy's a nobody. Apparently, he was in possession of an anomalous artifact, came the doctor's reply. He looked through the one-way glass into the interrogation room. Sat at the table wearing a matching pair of hideous pajamas was a wiry, brown-haired man. What was it? Researcher Werb asked, not bothering to check the file. A mask, apparently, Macme replied. This thing can form a symbiotic connection with whoever wears it. This guy's had it for a while. It causes him to undergo a dramatic intensification of his personality when he puts it on, as well as granting him some, uh, unusual abilities. Hold on, aren't you just describing SCP-035? Werb said, looking confused. Nope, the doctor responded by handing him a clear evidence bag. And it was a single wooden mask, a dull darkish green tint to the object. It looked to be almost viking in its design, with three holes on its surface, one for the mouth and two for the eyes. It was hard to deny, it was completely different from the white porcelain of SCP-035. What's this guy's name again? Werb sighed, looking at the scruffy, pajama-clad man waiting for them. Ipkiss, his colleague replied. Stanley Ipkiss. Meanwhile, locked up tight in a hermetically sealed glass case was another anomalous mask. SCP-035 was kept under lock and key by the Foundation, guarded constantly by a pair of armed security officers. One of them, Officer Regert, had noticed something strange about the infamous possessive mask today, or stranger than usual anyway. SCP-035 was known to compel people to wear it if they were close enough, often through subtle, psychic whispers, but today it seemed restless almost agitated, like it found something nearby to be intensely annoying. I already told you everything I know, Stanley Ipkiss sighed exhaustedly. He'd been dragged out of bed at the crack of dawn by strange agents and was now being interrogated about what he knew of the wooden mask he'd come across floating in the river one fateful night. I don't know where it came from, I swear, I didn't even realize I still had it. Uh, we threw it back in the river, but my dog must have swum out and fetched it, Stanley explained. You have no idea what this thing is, not even from any first-hand experience, Mr. Ipkiss? Dr. Mackney asked, holding the mask up. Look, I did take it to a psychologist who told me it might be Scandinavian, a representation of some Norse night god, uh, Loki, I think, he answered. We're not interested in this mask as a historical art piece, researcher Werb retorted. Tell us what happens when you put it on. Stanley paused for a moment, clearly aware he was in real trouble but nervous about coughing up the details to his shady captors. With a sigh, he decided it was best to confess. <sighs> I don't know how it works, but whenever you put it on, it's like it brings your deepest desires to life. When I wear that mask, I can do anything, be anything, he described, remembering a key detail. But it only works at night. Dr. Mackney and researcher Werb exchanged looks, uncertain if Ipkiss was just a lunatic or if there was truth to what he was telling them. Assemble a security team, Mackney sighed. We'll arrange a safe environment for you tonight, Mr. Epkiss. Elsewhere in the facility, Regert and his fellow security officer, Duggan, was watching over SCP-035 with growing concern. What do you reckon has this thing so agitated? Duggan wondered aloud. Who knows, Regert sighed. I've already reported it to command, told them 035's in a mood. They said to proceed as normal. Suddenly, as the words left his mouth, Officer Regert felt strange. It was like he had been hooked by an overwhelming urge to put the possessive mask on. 
He barely noticed he had reached to unlock the door sealing the area where SCP-035 was contained in its case, and as he stepped through, Officer Dugan's pleas for him to stop barely registered. The other officer tried in vain to pull Rieger back as he walked towards the possessive mask, only to feel his co-worker grip his shirt and swing him face first over and over again into the glass case containing the anomalous object. His body going completely limp after being used to break the glass, Rieger dropped Dugan to the floor, too lost in his trance-like state, to realize he'd just killed a fellow Foundation security officer. He was too focused on SCP-035 as he lifted it up and placed it over his face. Meanwhile, Stanley Ipkiss had been brought to a testing area, a team of security officers standing around him. The fact that they were all armed did little to ease Stanley's nerves. Dr. Mackney strode up to him, pulling the green wooden mask out of the airtight bag it had been sealed in, and handed it to Stanley. No funny business, Mr. Ipkiss, the doctor warned. I really can't promise that, Stanley replied. He looked at the mask in his hands, noticed a green shimmer over the reverse side of it. As much as he had gladly given it up, part of him had missed wearing it. He could already hear the low rumbling of thunder outside as he lifted it towards his face, feeling it almost leap out of his hands and latch itself onto him. The green mask eagerly became attached to Stanley, the surface of it spreading out where it covered his face and wrap around his entire head. Around him, the guards cautiously stepped back as they watched Stanley convulse and writhe around the place uncontrollably, like a man possessed. Both researcher Word and Dr. Mackney looked at each other in wordless disbelief, before turning back to the scene unfolding before their eyes. The booming noise of thunder and cracks of lightning rang out, despite this all taking place indoors, as Stanley Ipkiss vanished in the center of a miniature tornado that spun wildly around the testing area, before slowing to a halt. In its place stood a maniacal, wide-eyed figure, dressed in a garish yellow zoot suit and wearing an enormous toothed grin on his bright green face. How do, fellas? The mask bombastically hooted at the guards. Having been trained to deal with absurd anomalies aplenty, the security team all defensively raised their weapons out of a mix of instinct and confusion. Eesh, rough crowd, <laughs> the green-faced lunatic stated to nobody. It looked like he had turned aside as if addressing some invisible audience. Outstretching both arms and one leg, the mask instantly zipped off, hurling around the room in a whirlwind of absurdity, in the style of an old Tex Avery cartoon. The spinning, cackling combination of Stanley Ipkiss and the magical mask weaved in between the Foundation guards, all of whom tried in vain to restrain him until he disappeared out of the door. After him! Dr. Mackney yelled with urgency in his voice. The guards all turned to run after the mask, only for each one of them to trip over and land face first on the floor of the testing area, as if something had tied them all up by their ankles. It was only after the security officers all struggled back up to their feet that they noticed their pants had been yanked down, leaving the Foundation's finest somewhat embarrassed, to say the least. Outside the testing area, Stanley, or rather the mask, had already closed the door behind him. Out of nowhere, he produced a series of wooden planks and began hammering them into the doorframe, boarding it up before speedily adding chains and padlocks to the mix. Sighing and in an over-exaggerated manner, wiping the sweat from his brow, he turned around, only to be met with the sight of even more SCP Foundation guards lying in wait, their guns all trained on him. The mask gave a scream of pure terror that briefly sent his skull popping out of his head and his eyes shooting out of his skull before everything zipped right back into its original place. His eyes darted around at the faces of the Foundation security, wondering how he was going to get out of this one. Oh gee, this all seems familiar, he said either to himself or his audience. Well, if it ain't broken, hit it! In the blink of an eye, the mask's bright yellow outfit had transformed replaced by a silk blue rumba shirt with ruffled sleeves, white pants, and a wide-brim black hat. As they watched him stood at the ready, a few of the guards noticed the sound of… music? Not one of them could tell where it was coming from, nor could they help starting to tap their feet or bob their heads to the rhythm of the Cuban Pete rumba. The entire security team quickly erupted into a full-blown dance number that anyone who saw it couldn't resist joining, all led by the mask, wildly waving maracas in the air and singing. Elsewhere in the facility, Officer Riegert was beginning to melt. He still had SCP-035 covering his face, the frown of the possessive mask conveying the entity's sheer discontent. The black ooze secreting from its porcelain surface had the unfortunate effect of corroding and melting down anyone that wore it, 
dissolving them entirely after a short period of time. Determined, SCP-035 pushed on, plotting its host towards a storage room. If it remembered correctly, the SCP Foundation had stored a number of temporary hosts for it, mannequins that, while not human, had enough of a humanoid shape for the possessive mask to use. Of course, after all of its attempts to escape, the Foundation had rescinded its privilege to be granted new hosts, not that it could stop it from taking them by force. Using the last of Officer Riegert's dwindling strength, SCP-035 barged its way into the storeroom. Sure enough, waiting there for it was a row of discarded mannequins. Lifting Riegert's hands before they had fully melted away, the possessive mask used him to place itself on a new body. Elsewhere not too far away in the Foundation facility, a conga line of security officers and research personnel was parading through the corridors, all happily dancing and jiving to the music, despite still no one being able to figure out where it was coming from. Dashing away from his spot at the front of the line, the mask zipped around a corner, his clothes having changed back to his signature brightly colored zoot suit. Never say no to a party, he exclaimed after having danced his way to freedom. The sound of something shuffling closer quickly caught the mask's attention. He turned around to find himself standing green face to porcelain face with SCP-035. You. The masked mannequin raised a hollow arm, pointing a finger from its host at Stanley. You bear the god of mischief's carving. I could sense its presence since you arrived. Still in my look, nobody likes a copycat fella, the mask replied. Although intimidation is the sincerest form of flattery, and that's how Jim Carrey's career started. <laughs> he added, exploding with raucous laughter. Cease your prattling! SCP-035 hissed with spite. Say, perhaps we're related. The mask ignored it. Oh, we could be long lost family. You know, I always wanted kids of my own. Son of the mask has a nice ring to it, right? He paused once again, turning away to his unseen audience. On second thought, maybe not. The SCP-035 controlled mannequin leapt forward, gripping the mask's arm, causing him to scream in shock at the advanced. His eyes bulged out of their sockets, zooming in on the corrosive black secretions oozing from SCP-035. The mannequin's other hand started reaching upwards, gripping his oversized green head as if it were trying to lift the mask right off of Stanley's face. Zooming away again, he sped down the nearest corridor his arms stretching behind him, still clamped in SCP-035's grip. Coming to a screeching halt with the comical sound of car brakes, the mask wobbled his outstretched arm. A ripple traveled all the way along the elongated limb, as if it was made of elastic. His wrist still being held by the mannequin sporting the possessive mask, the force of the flailing rubbery arm was so great that it flung SCP-035's host body around, sending it head first into the ceiling then plummeting back down to the ground. Its grip loosened, allowing the mask to reel back its stretchy arm, although it didn't return to normal length right away. His own hand pinged back and hit him in the face, only to start urgently trying to communicate of its own accord. What's that, boy? The mask said to his hand as it started performing a series of signals. Little Timmy stuck down a well. You'd like a Friday night off? There's a two-bit chump wearing another mask walking menacingly down the hall towards us? The hand suddenly turned the mask's head to look in the right direction. Sure enough, SCP-035 was using the mannequin to walk down the hall towards him. His elongated arm quickly returned to its normal size, as the green-faced lunatic took a quick draw stance, facing his oncoming adversary. Now, you have to ask yourself one question. He sneered, doing a fairly convincing impression of a green Clint Eastwood. Do I feel lucky? With a sweep of his hand, the mask had drawn an enormous weapon. The thing was a gigantic mass of different artillery, clicking and whirring. There were barrels on top of barrels, rockets, and other explosives locked into place. Do I feel lucky? The mask continued. Well, do you, punk? SCP-035 did nothing to slow its advance, so the mask pulled the trigger. Every one of his weapon's various components spat out a tiny flag with the word BANG written on it. Ah, performance issue. He said, doing his aside once again. Not that I'm overcompensating for anything. Clearly growing agitated, piloting its host, SCP-035 started charging towards the mask. Immediately, he spun around, becoming a tornado of hyperactivity and whooping noises as he sped down the adjacent corridor. The possessive mask staggered after him. The ooze leaking from the porcelain anomaly was dripping onto the mannequin wearing it. 
causing the plastic to be melted away, exposing the flimsy metal skeleton beneath. It knew it had to merge with a new host, find something else to corrupt. SCP-035 chased after the cartoonish troublemaker, knowing that if it could catch him, he'd be able to survive merging with it. His body, while wearing the other mask, barely obeyed the laws of physics, making him invulnerable to damage and possibly even the corrosive substance oozing from the possessive mask. As if those weren't enough reasons, his power seemed virtually limitless. Combined with the green-headed lunatic, SCP-035 could do anything. Reaching a stop at the end of another corridor, the mask spun around, wearing a comically undersized baseball uniform. He reached into his pocket and produced an oversized baseball bat, then proceeded to start hurling baseballs into the air and swatting them as hard as he could. As the mask increased the speed of his swings, a volley of hard cork baseballs were fired down the corridor like a barrage of bullets, ricocheting off the walls and hitting the oncoming SCP-035. Each one struck its target, reeling the mannequin, but doing little much else to stop it getting closer and closer, until, with an almighty swing, the mask brought his bat crashing into SCP-035 with enough force to send the possessive mask and its hosts careening down the corridor. It sailed through the air, bursting through a wall, then flew into a research lab, tearing a huge hole in the next wall as it kept going. Finally, it came crashing out of the last wall, the outer wall of the facility, and dropped multiple stories to the ground outside. Changing costumes back to his classic suit and dashing after SCP-035, the mask passed through all the holes his adversary had left in the multiple walls it had crashed into. He screeched to a halt again and paused after getting through the outer wall, only to realize after a moment that he was hovering in mid-air, not standing on anything. Reaching into his suit pocket, the mask pulled out a sign on a stick with a single word written on it. Yikes. He plummeted down to ground level, landing with such an immense crash that his body cracked into the asphalt below. It left a perfect outline of him imprinted in the ground, causing the mask to go completely pancake flat head to toe. Suddenly, before he could peel himself up off the ground and go back to being three-dimensional, SCP-035 staggered to its host's feet and pinned the mask down. Finally, it growled. I've caught you. I've won. Your power is mine. Once I've combined with you, I will be able to ravage this world. I'm going to fuse to your face. Then I'll start with decimating those wretches that imprison me. The foundation will fall, and then so will the rest of their precious world. Forcefully, the mannequin's hand wrenched the mask off the ground. But as SCP-035 turned to look at what it had hoped to be its next host, well, let's just say the tragedy frown carved into its porcelain face had never been more appropriate. It wasn't holding the mask, it was holding a life-size cardboard cutout of a photo of the mask, grinning out from one side. Enraged, the possessive mask tore the decoy in half with its mannequin's hands. Hey, Pachuco! said a cartoonish voice from right behind it. Did you miss me? The mask had reappeared for real this time, grinning with his huge teeth, clearly getting a kick out of having someone to torment. SCP-035, on the other hand, had been getting increasingly irritated by all the wacky cartoon antics. With all the aggression it could channel through its mannequin host, it gripped the mask by the throat, his eyes bulging out of his head again. See, no need to get all choked up over it! He gagged. You are so tiresome! The possessive mask yelled, having finally run out of patience. You know what? I won't merge with you. I should just kill you and put an end to your buffoonery. Let me take this thing off you first, though. Its mannequin fingers started to hook into the mask's seam at the back of his bald green head. Wait, wait! The mask begged, putting up both his hands in surrender. At least give me a final request, huh? Master Mask! Before the possessive mask could respond, the mask had swept it off its dissolving mannequin feet. He started to spin it around in a wild, over-the-top dance number, bopping and swinging to a tune that seemed to be coming from nowhere. The longer it went on for, the more and more of SCP-035's host's body started to dissolve away until the mannequin finally wasted away. All that was left was a bubbling pile of black goo on the ground with the possessive mask laying in the middle. The mask chuckled, noticing the fumes trailing upwards into the air as the corrosive substance melted away the last of SCP-035's host. Talk about smoking! Now go and check out What If SCP-343 Wore SCP-035, and the whole story What If SCP-096 Wore SCP-035, 
for more adventures from the evil SCP-035.